If you want to follow along, we're looking this morning at Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 2, um, and primarily we're looking at Simeon and lessons that we can learn from him. There was a man and he was harried and harassed and it was Christmas time and he had a long list of shopping for people that he needed to get gifts for. And he came to his mother-in-law's name and oh dear, what am I going to get my mother-in-law? And he came up with the perfect gift. I'll get her a burial plot. So that's what he gave her that year. The next year, he didn't give her anything. And when she asked why, he said, you didn't use the gift I gave you last year. What is a perfect gift? What is the good thing that God gives to us? We are now in the season of Christmas. On Saturdays, I take my sermon for a walk, and as I'm walking around the neighborhood and walking down Chicken Plant Road, at the end of the road, in the ditch, are all these Christmas trees. We're in Christmas right now. Christmas doesn't start when we say goodbye to Halloween on October 31st. It started last week, and it runs until Epiphany, and we are in the season of Christmas right now. It's a season of God giving us his best. He gives us his gift. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave, freely delivered him up for us all, how will he not also along with his son freely give us all things? This is a season of sharing, a season of goodwill, a season of gift giving. And God has given us the best that he has to give. As we look at this passage in Luke's gospel, I want to start at the end of it and then back, go back to the beginning. At verse 39, um, they went to the temple and it says here that, um, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, Mary and Joseph and Jesus returned to Galilee. It was very important that Jesus fulfill all righteousness. Adam, the first Adam, our forefather, is the one who rebelled against God. And um, now the law has been given. And Jesus, the second Adam, Jesus fulfills all righteousness. Jesus, where Adam was disobedient, Jesus is obedient. Where Adam rebelled, Jesus did what the law required. And so Mary and Jesus and Joseph arrive at the temple, and that's where our passage picks up. But we've got to remember it was a journey for them to get there. They went from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus because there was a tax and they had to return to their hometown. And then they went from there in Bethlehem. Now they've got to come to Jerusalem. And travel in the ancient world isn't like travel today. They didn't get on the bullet train and zoom right there. There they were in Jerusalem. No, they had to walk that whole way. They had to sleep by the side of the road. This was a poor, a destitute, a penniless couple. And this um, trip to Jerusalem was costly to them, costly in time, costly in energy, costly in their treasure, of which they didn't have much in the way of, of treasure. And so they arrive at the temple. Now, why are they there? To fulfill all righteousness. The firstborn son of a family was to be dedicated to the Lord, given to the Lord, set apart to be holy. Um, why is that? because it was a reminder to the children of Israel that they had once been slaves. And that child then is purchased back. He is redeemed from his service to the Lord and brought back to the family by a sacrifice. And that sacrifice in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8, was customarily and was supposed to be a lamb. Um, but Mary and Joseph are broke, and they don't have that. So the law made provisions for those who were poor, and they could give either two turtle doves or two young pigeons in, as a sacrifice. The first was given as a redemption, to buy the child back for the family. The second one was given as a sin offering. And so the um, sacrifices were made in the temple. Now that's part of it. Another part of it is that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant made with Abraham was a, a covenant that was signified in a circumcision of the flesh. So the child had to be presented at the temple and had to be circumcised on his eighth day. And so again, to fulfill all righteousness, the Holy Family arrives in Jerusalem on the eighth day to do these things. 
And there's still one more reason. A woman who gives birth in Israel was considered to be unclean for a week after having given birth. And so now she must make a sacrifice in order to be considered to be clean and welcome back into society. So the family has arrived in Jerusalem to do all of these things. And here's where we pick up the story with Simeon. Now, who is Simeon? According to Christian legend, I'm not sure that it's true, and I give you that caveat, but according to Christian legend, he was 113 years old. And if you look at the text with me, it says this, verse 27, And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed him. Simeon was a priest. He worked in the temple. And part of his duties were when these families would arrive and he'd have to have these sacrifices, he would be the one that would serve that family and see them through all the various sacrifices that they had to do. And he is the one who would dedicate these children and he would ask, as I do at baptism, what is your child's name? Not because we don't know the child's name, but names are very important in the scriptures. And so Mary was told by an angel. You are to name him Jesus. But they didn't speak English. We speak English. His name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yeshua. Yeshua is, uh, Yahweh is salvation. And so Simeon, serving in the temple, had been promised by God, by the Holy Spirit, that he wouldn't see death uh, until he saw the Messiah. Now, how do we know that? It doesn't tell us that in the Old Testament. Luke, at the beginning of his gospel, says, look, I sat down to put all of the story of Jesus down in an orderly fashion. I've gone and I've researched it and I've talked to the eyewitnesses and I've recorded all of these things so that you can understand and know these things that have taken place. He probably interviewed Mary and Mary probably shared this reflection that we're looking at this morning about Simeon and about what took place in the temple. So Simeon having been promised by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die, what would it be like to live that way? God, the Holy Spirit, comes to you and gives you a promise that you won't die, you won't taste death until you see the consolation of Israel, until you see the fulfillment of all of God's workings in the Old Testament in, in, the, in the Messiah. You know, that was the first advent of our Lord. And in the parables of judgment in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus says that we are to live the same way that Simeon lived. That Simeon rolled out of bed every day. Is it Christmas? Is today the day that the Messiah is going to show up? I'm going to the temple to do my duty and to fulfill my life's calling and my life's mission. And is today the day when I'm going to hold the Messiah in my hands? And Jesus says to us, I will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. There's a second advent, and that we are to follow the example of Simeon and live with a sense of purpose. Jesus says we are to be alert, that we are to be awake, that we are to be prepared, because his coming could happen at any time. We should be just like Simeon, with a sense of expectation and a sense of hope. When there's no tomorrow, there's no hope. But we have God's promises. And so there is hope for every one of us that he's going to come again and he's going to set everything right and he's going at the consummation to make everything the way that it's supposed to be. And that's a promise for us at this Christmas season. So here's Simeon and here's this young couple and he looks at them and here's a penniless carpenter and here's a teenage bride, she might be 14 years old. They've been on the road for weeks. They are played out. They are exhausted. They've got the dirt and the grime of the road all over them. They didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express. They didn't take a shower that morning. They've been on the road, and they come, and they hand to Simeon this eight-pound bundle of joy. And Simeon was a product of his culture, a product of his time, a product of his place. He had the same expectation of a Messiah that Israel did that the Messiah would be a geopolitical leader, that he would be a king, that he would be a general, that he would take the foot of the Roman occupation off of the neck of the people of God in Israel, and that they would rise up to the glory that had once been theirs in Solomon. And this is what they were expecting. And here's Simeon looking at this young couple, just worn out from travel with this little baby. And sometime between receiving the baby in his hands and turning toward the altar and to lift it up, to bless the baby and to dedicate the baby, 
the Holy Spirit, we don't know why or how, but the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he has the Messiah. In addition to being a priest, Simeon was a prophet, and he has some prophetic words about this experience. The first is this, so he turns and he lifts the baby up, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. He didn't have a fear of death. He has been living in an expectation of the fulfillment of the promises of God. He lives every day with hope, every day with expectation, every day with, is today going to be the day? And this day was that day. And he recognized that I have done what God has called me to do and that I, now I'm going to depart in peace. And it's a good thing, and it's a blessing. He doesn't shake in fear, and he doesn't tremble, and he doesn't worry that this is God's blessing for him, and it's God's blessing for us. We live by grace and faith in Jesus Christ. We live with the same hope and expectation and wonder, and we live for the day when our Father says to us, well done, good and faithful servant, as I'm sure he said to Simeon. So there's a good example here for us. And then verse 30, here are his prophetic words. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Again, he's taken this baby and lifted him up and dedicated him, and his name is Yeshua. Um, I have seen your salvation. Yeshua is, the, is Yahweh's salvation. Our Greek New Testament says soterion. And if you look into a lexicon, soterion means salvation, Defender, deliverer, or the one who brings salvation, the one who defends, and the one who brings deliverance. And that was the messianic expectation. Unfortunately, they misunderstood. Their expectations were all wrong. This would be one who would save them from Rome. This would be the one who would defend them against the Roman legions. This would be the one who would deliver them to the glory that had once been theirs. They've got the right words, but their understanding of what those words meant is all wrong. Jesus didn't come to save them from the Roman Empire. A few years later, 70 AD, the uh, general Titus uh, laid siege to Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. He didn't save the Jews from the Romans. He didn't defend them against the legions. He didn't deliver them to their glorious, what they expected, their, their glorious dreams. Simeon was a man who was sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. He did all of these things in the Spirit, and the Spirit changed his understanding from what was expected. Where is this glorious king? Now he's holding the, ben, uh, the baby of a penniless couple, and he realized that there's something else that this baby's supposed to do. If we go back to the story in Genesis, our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. They rejected him. And we have all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, the proto-euangelion, the, the early good news, that in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the beginning of God's outworking of his plans for his Messiah all the way back in Genesis. And then if we look down at verse 21, if you're with me in Genesis, you don't have to go there. I'm going to read it. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. You remember the story. Adam was, or God came to the garden and was walking in the cool of the day. And he's looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? I'm over here, Lord, under the bush. What are you doing under the bush, Adam? Well, I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you... Eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. I gave you one commandment. I gave you one thing to do, and you're telling me that you couldn't do the one thing I told you to do. They had rebelled against God, and there were consequences to this rebellion. And here we have the introduction of a blood sacrifice. Now, it doesn't say it in the text, but the tradition is that God sacrificed a lamb, and he skinned it, and he created garments for Adam and Eve to cover their shame, their humiliation, their nakedness, their guilt from the thing that they had done. And we still live with that shame and nakedness and guilt. All of us live that way. And what was Adam's response? Hey, God, it's your fault. You gave me that woman, and she baked me an apple pie. It's not my fault. It's her fault. So we blame God. Or God... This woman that you gave me, now it's her fault. 
And we live with the consequences of that rebellion of our first parents. We are alienated from God. That's our problem. It's not Rome. It's not politics. Our problem is spiritual, and we are alienated from God, and we're alienated from one another. And so Jesus came to bring salvation, not politically. He came to bring salvation spiritually, to deal with the roots of our problem. And our problem is interpersonal, that we're alienated from God and from one another. And so God does a temporary fix. He takes and sacrifices a, a blood sacrifice of a lamb and covers Adam and Eve in skins, and it's a temporary fix to their problem. But it isn't the permanent solution. But we remember what John the Baptist says about Jesus. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the permanent solution to this pickle that we find ourselves in. So. Simeon's first prophetic word is that my eyes have seen your salvation. Secondly, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Jesus, according to John's gospel, is the light of the world. And in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, hey, not just me, you all are the light of the world. It was God's intent, it was God's plan, it was God's purpose that Israel were to be a light to the world. But they failed in their mission. They covered over the light and said, no, he's our God. And they hugged themselves to him and said, we are his chosen people and he's not for you all. And Jesus came as a light of revelation to the Gentiles. You'll hear these words from Isaiah and they're familiar at Christmas time. Isaiah chapter nine, verse two. The people who walked in darkness, who's that? The Gentiles don't have the revelation. They don't have the scriptures. They don't have the law. Those who walk in darkness, and that's good news for us because most of us have a Gentile background. For the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Jesus is that light of revelation to the Gentiles. Chapter 49, verse 6. And it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The Messiah came from the Jews. He came to the Jews. He was for the Jews, but he's taking his salvation to the ends of the earth. He isn't only for the Jews. It's a wonderful metaphor, this metaphor of light. Um, my middle son, when he was little, say we'd say, Caleb, it's time for bed, and he'd go up the stairs, but he wouldn't go in his bedroom, and he'd yell down the stairs, can't go in there, there's ghosts in there, and I can't reach the flitch. It's over his head. Ghosts and flitches, but what does light do? Light casts out fear. Light settles fear, and so there isn't anything to be afraid of. We go upstairs, we turn the light on, and he hops into bed, and he doesn't need a light, night light. He's seen around his room. The ghosts are all gone. All is right with the world. Jesus is the light of the world, and he settles these issues of fear and worry. Um, I seldom get up at the crack of dawn. It's just a confession. But occasionally when I'm up at the crack of dawn, light brings life to stillness. In the early morning when it's still dark, it's quiet, but as the light, as the sun begins to rise and as the light begins to infiltrate, then the birds begin to chirp and the cicadas in the trees begin to do their thing and the squirrels begin to run around and with the squirrels then comes all the dogs barking in the neighborhood because the squirrels are out and they go out to play with the squirrels and there is this life that comes to the stillness because light has come into the world. Light reveals mystery. You hear the scratching up in your attic, and there's scurrying and scratching, and what on earth is going on above my ceiling? And you're not afraid of it, but what, what on earth is that? So you pop the hatch, and you go in, and you turn on the light, and your attic is full of squirrels. Mystery solved. Um, this, is, this is what light does for us, and this is the Messiah. He shines light on those who are living in darkness, and he brings all of the blessings of light. Jesus is salvation. Jesus is a light of revelation. He's revelation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And Simeon continues, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Jesus wasn't glorious by worldly standards. 
He wasn't dressed in purple. He didn't have a crown. He wasn't covered in jewels. By worldly standards, he is the least likely person in the universe to fulfill this ministry and mission that God has given him. He is the son of paupers. He lives in the sticks, and yet he is the glory of my people Israel. Why? What did the angels say? If you've got your Bibles open and we look back to the shepherds and the angels, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. His son, the Messiah, is the glory of Israel because he will finish and fulfill the ministry and the, excuse me, the ministry and the mission that Israel was supposed to do as a revelator of Yahweh to the world. The Messiah will do that. And all the world will turn their attention to Israel because of what and who the Messiah is. Our Old Testament passage this morning was from Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. And the nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name. Jesus fulfills all righteousness. His family takes him to the temple that he can be the obedient son, where, Ab where Adam was the disobedient son. Jesus fulfills all righteousness in that he does all of the things that he was called and created to do as the Messiah of Israel. And all of this is being done in the hands of God's servant, Simeon. Simeon, again, was a man who was content with life. He had a ministry, he had a roof over his head, he had the things that he needed, all he wanted, all he lived for was the consolation of Israel, for the fulfillment of the promise of God and the coming of the Messiah. Do we, like Simeon, look forward to that day when Jesus promises that he will come again? You know, our culture is very different than the world of the scriptures. This is New Year's Eve. And we, some of you have made resolutions already, uh, promises that we make to ourselves. A few years ago, there was a Gallup poll, and George Gallup uh, said, that here are the top four resolutions that people make uh, on an annual basis. The first one is, I'll get my financial house in order. That's a good one. I like that one. Second one is, I'll quit smoking for those who are smoking. Often, in, you know, they turn over a new leaf and they have a resolution, they're going to quit smoking. The third one is, they'll lose weight. The fourth one is, they'll go to the gym and they'll exercise more. And these resolutions, they're all privatized and they're all inward focused and it's all about me as an individual. But we weren't created that way. We were created to love. We were created to receive love. We were created to give love. That's what got disrupted in the garden. We are alienated from God. We are alienated from one another. Where are the resolutions that say, I'm going to love God this year? And various ways of demonstrating to myself as well as to God that I'm going to love him. Where are the resolutions that I'm going to be a good neighbor and I'm going to love my neighbor? this year? Where are the spiritual resolutions about growing spiritually in my life of faith with God? Simeon didn't need to make resolutions because he was content in his calling. He was content in his life. Are we content in our calling? Are we content in our life? Have we placed our faith in this promised Messiah who brings with him salvation and revelation and glorification? Amen.